In previous tutorials on this channel, we've used AI to generate these apps, a Java REST API, a Next.js UI that consumes that REST API, an application that implements retrieval, augment, and generation, or RAG, to let us consume a web page and ask questions about it, a command line utility that lets us select a target shell environment and ask for commands that satisfy a particular goal. We use tools like the Ader AI Coding Assistant, ChatGPT, PlantUML, VS Code, and the Cloud 3.5 Sonnet Large Language Model. We use prompts like these to have AI generate code, add external knowledge to our coding assistant, generate unit tests, readme files, diagrams, and more. If you haven't already watched these tutorials, it might be a good time to do so. They're not prerequisites for this video, but they will certainly be helpful to you in providing context for what I'm about to share with you. Although I shared a few tips along the way in those videos, I feel like this is a good time to take a step back and explain why you saw me doing what you saw me doing in the way that you saw me doing it. In this video, we're gonna talk about the whys behind the process and the prompting techniques we used in those tutorials. Understanding this should definitely be helpful to you in applying these lessons to your own projects. Before we start walking through specific examples and prompting techniques, I wanna share with you just a few high impact principles that I find very useful in my own work. When you can adopt this mindset and integrate it consistently, you'll find that your results in working with AI coding assistants or AI in general will radically improve. Here we go. Principle one, have realistic expectations of AI. If we come into it thinking that we'll be able to build a non-trivial app with AI in one or two shots, we'll be very disappointed. And if we think that we don't need to learn the skill of interacting with AI, our results will frankly, well, suck. Principle two, develop iteratively. This has long been standard practice in the software industry. It really just means that we create a little, test a little, create a little, test a little. And it doesn't change at all when you're using AI to develop. And the same really applies to using AI to generate anything of any complexity, really, whether it's documentation, ideas, or anything else. Now, for those of you thinking, I don't really have very much development experience, so I might as well just give up now. Nope. Yes, you do need to get development experience under your belt, and that does mean you need to spend some time developing some projects without the help of a coding assistant to generate your code. Understand that AI is there as your hyper smart, super productive sidekick, but an engineering mindset, software development experience, and practicing using AI and learning techniques, such as the ones I'm about to share with you, are still absolutely required. The good news is that by combining writing your own code with also leveraging AI coding assistance to help you build projects and then use AI to explain and teach you about those projects can greatly accelerate your learning curve. And it can help keep you motivated by quickly building things that you can use win-win. Okay, let's start getting specific. First tip, before turning your coding assistant loose on a task, prepare it for the task. In this screenshot from a previous tutorial, we see how we kicked off our Ader session before starting to build our new app. To get going, I needed to provide some external context to Ader. In this case, project documentation that includes our high-level technical architecture and the initial set of user stories. Now, I could have just tried to have Ader ingest all the documentation straight away, but I've learned in working with Ader in Cloud 3.5 that Cloud tends to get a little bit eager and starts moving on to tasks before I'm ready to begin. This technique, in my experience, almost always keeps Claude focused on the current task, which is just adding information for use later. Once we've prepped Ada, we can start having it ingest our documentation. Because we told Ada what we were about to do and set clear expectations for Ada, Ada does only what we ask. Tip number two, tell the assistant what not to do. Notice the wording of this prompt. I'm directly telling Ada not to do more than I've asked. Now, this may no longer be necessary if you're watching this in the future. As models and assistants advance, it's likely these technologies will mitigate many of these issues on your behalf. Tip number three, have the assistant fix bugs by showing it the error. In one of our tutorials, Ader generated this bug. Ader had all the code that's been generated in its context, so all we needed to do was copy and paste the runtime error into Ader and ask it to fix it. When Ader does generate a bug, I've almost always been able to get it to correct the bug and explain what caused the bug. Now it may take two to three tries, but it usually fixes it. 
My own experience since I started using Aider with Claude 3.5 has been that I'm not seeing a lot of bugs being generated by Aider, but maybe that's because I'm practicing iterative development and also following this next tip I'm going to share. Tip number four, give AI small focused tasks. Did I mention realistic expectations and iterative development yet? Just checking. Notice here that we're asking Aider to only implement code for this highly focused use case. Remember what I said earlier, have realistic expectations and work iteratively. I feel like I've said that before. By the way, even if Aider could reliably generate a ton of code in one shot, we wouldn't want it to. Why? At some point, we will need to intervene to correct something, so we'd better track what's going on. Tip number five, always review code updates. In the case of Aider, you get a nice summary of the updates Aider's making after each prompt. You can see an example of Aider explaining the updates it's making here. Review that and the updates in the files it generated. The rationale for this is similar to the previous tip on why we need to develop iteratively. We developers are still responsible for the results and we have to understand the code. Tip six, focus on a particular AI tool set. Spend a little upfront time exploring a handful of coding assistants and LLMs. Research which AI models software engineers are reporting to work best for software development. Quickly narrow the field, select your core tool set, and focus on mastering that. For someone looking to use AI for the purpose of building software versus purely doing AI research, that's more important than learning to use a dozen tools. Tip 7. Mastering your tool set. It's important to note that some techniques are somewhat tool and LLM dependent. I'm mostly using Cloud 3.5 Sonnet with Ada right now. If you're using Aider with another model, say GPT-40, you may or may not need to implement all of the prompting techniques I shared, or you may need to implement additional ones. As with many such techniques, over time, LLMs tend to address these issues and a lot of this tedious stuff may no longer be required in the near future. In general, what works well for interfacing with one tool or LLM is not guaranteed to work well with a different one. Now I saved my most controversial tip for last. Ready? Don't make a sport out of optimizing LLM costs. Think in terms of ROI instead. I see so many developers spending hours and hours trying to figure out how to get their LLM costs down from 40 bucks a month. That's about what I spend between the two primary LLMs I use each month. Until we can run small local models that perform coding tasks well on our commodity PCs, I don't think that 10 bucks a month for someone creating software professionally is realistic. And even if it is, consider the number of hours you'll spend trying to save $30. Your time is valuable. Getting your software to market fast is valuable. In general, it would be highly unusual for a tool that could let you deliver, say, a new set of features to your customers in three weeks versus four weeks to be of less value than $40 a month. Now, I recognize some people may be in a position where they truly can't afford that. I understand that. Maybe you're a hobbyist, your budget's tight, and you're not earning money for your development work anyway. I get it. There are exceptions to every rule. But if the bang you're getting out of using AI isn't worth more than 40 bucks a month to you, then I'd suggest using AI may not even be where you should be spending your time or money in the first place. Once again, I understand there are exceptions to every rule. Now, before we wrap up, I wanted to quickly touch upon the idea of using AI with large code bases. I sometimes get comments from folks who are working with repositories in the tens of thousands of lines of code. Now I have to be honest, over the past decade or so, I don't have a lot of experience working with large code bases. And that's because I focused more on the microservice style of architecture recently. And if you have a microservice that's 10,000 lines of code, well, you're calling it something it ain't. What I can tell you is that when I work on newer, smaller, and well-designed code bases, and I follow the practices that I've outlined in this video, the current coding assistants, especially Aider using Claude 3.5, perform exceptionally well across the board on all tasks from code generation to unit testing to documentation, etc. Now I try my best not to offer authoritative advice on things I don't have direct personal experience with. Now, I do have a lot of experience with large monolithic code bases, just not recently and never using AI coding assistants. I'll report more tips on this topic once I have more direct experience using AI with large code bases. Now I expect that to be coming soon as I have a couple of new clients who have this exact scenario.
Meantime, I'll share a few thoughts about what I suspect could cause problems when working with AI against any legacy code base, especially a large one. Number one, poorly written code. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, files, functions, variables, with naming conventions that don't convey any real meaning. Bury a function named getData in the middle of 10,000 lines of code and see if AI or any human can find it easily and make sense of it. Remember the realistic expectations thing? I may have mentioned that. Issue two, undocumented or poorly documented code. Similar to the naming issue, Poorly documented or undocumented code will make it hard for any entity to comprehend the code. Now, as a totally contrived example, I first created this function intentionally using naming and documentation that's ambiguous. Then I asked Ader to refactor that code to add documentation and names that were more meaningful. Which do you think would be more easy for an AI or a human to understand? Number three, poorly structured code. Poorly organized code is very confusing either to a human or to AI. Maybe the developers didn't follow solid design principles such as single responsibility or separation of concerns, or maybe they did so in some cases and failed to do so in others. Here's a question. If you look at a new repository with just a little bit of guidance from the readme file, are you within 15 minutes able to get a good sense of how it's structured, what lives where, and what responsibilities are satisfied by which components? If not, that's the problem. Fix that regardless of AI. The old adage, garbage in, garbage out, still applies. If you're trying to work with large code bases with AI and not having much success, here's what I'll suggest. Take it for what it's worth as I personally have not done this yet. Use AI to analyze the code and look for areas of improvement, bit by bit, not all at once. Remember, focus and iteration, then use AI to refactor the code to improve it. Again, working on small units and focusing and iterating will work best. Now use AI to work on the improved code base. Unit testing, debugging, writing new enhancements, new features. Need I say it? Iterate, focus, small units will work best. Now I realize this may seem daunting, but hey, I don't make the rules, I'm just the messenger. Contrary to what I hear about AI generating junk code, I believe that if we learn to use AI tools correctly, the real promise of AI is in avoiding this kind of mess in the first place. Okay, so these tips are the tip of the iceberg. See what I did there? No shame. As a community, we're learning new practices together all the time. I soon plan to add some cheat sheets, guides, etc., to my website. Also, I often add a tips and techniques section in our bi-weekly newsletter. Now, I hope you found the tips in this video useful, and I'd love to hear from you if you apply any of these tips that you weren't already using and what your experience was. If you'd like to see more videos on this or similar topics, please let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoy this video, please like and subscribe. I'm Tim Kitchens, Coding the Future with You, and I look forward to seeing you in future videos.